Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 2 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan books of the following. This is part one of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Preach. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion, and there will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. And since we're just beginning, I'm going to really work hard at keeping it as spoiler free as possible. And it's always so easy at the beginning. <laughs> is it easier or harder? I think it's easier because the beginning is always kind of like the introductions. It's kind of like we're meeting the folks. And for you and me, it's like we're reintroducing some folks we haven't seen in a while. And you're like, hey, I kind of get distracted with that versus is so I don't get so distracted with like trying to drop some. I get bets with you. That magic occurs with you, sir. <laughs> That's a live transaction. <laughs> <laughs> I can say it has been challenging for me because we're starting to get to a point where some of the larger concepts and the overarching storyline for the entire series is starting to be introduced. It is opening doors for me that are minefields of spoilers. This is true. A great job. <laughs> a quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of sickly violence would that be a good way to describe it? sickly pale tumorous tumorous <laughs> I don't, medical violence I, I don't know disgusting tumorous violence <laughs> all right listener discretion is advised <laughs> do with that as you will um <laughs> our show is listener supported if you'd like to support us we'd really appreciate that you can do so by visiting our patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com currently we're posting ad-free episodes on patreon weekly also we'd really like to hear from you send any feedback or comments or corrections to contact at horsefrogproductions.com all right chapter two the chapter begins with an excerpt from a passage from silver fox quote one arm's host bled from countless wounds, an endless campaign, successive defeats followed by even costlier victories. But of all the wounds borne by the army of Dujek One Arm, those to its soul were the gravest. End quote. And this is by Outrider Herlikel. Now, this makes me wonder past or present wounds <laughs> or future wounds to its right. soul. Is he setting us up for something here? This is the beginning of the book, sir. I'm assuming that he is. Yes. <laughs> Why would he set out of the gate with wounds to its soul that were the gravest? Well, think about this. We have already suffered some of the gravest losses to Dujek. We lost the bridge burner, sir, at the beginning of Gardens. Right. I mean, that's a severe culling of... if. Any bridge burner is equal to like one-tenth as effective as the handful that are left to us. Could you imagine just how amazing these guys must have been? How terrifying they must have been in their thousands? Good gravy. <laughs> I wonder if the 80-20 rule applies within the bridge burners as well. I think you're right. They are an elite force. Yes. I do wonder if we are only seeing the best of the best. Yep. The cream, so to say, rose to the top and survived the ultimate call, mm -hmm. <laughs> as it were. But you had to realize that some of those fellas, I'm sure they've all earned their way in there in some way or another. So, I mean, even if they're just, you know, like I said, even if they're marginal, I'm assuming they're still above some of the just kind of average grunts that are in your forces. So that's a huge loss by one arm. Also, you do have a weird loss. Is he technically still supported at, in any way, shape, or form? from the empress under the table or is that just him cut loose to find his own ways and means we can't comment either for or against that okay copy that okay then i i'm gonna just kind of just just move along sir okay <laughs> i'm gonna get way into the weeds on i this don't one. know <laughs> if i can have my heart broken again is all i'm saying oh man please his books are always full of heartbreak dude <laughs> Same that's, that's part of, of course the, that's, that's part of the trademark now there are degrees of harshness in his books yes what level in this book? I'm not sure what to set my... Is it Chain of Dogs style? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. Move on. Nestled amidst the rocks and tumbled boulders of the hillside, Corporal Picker watched the old man make his way up the trail. His shadow slipped over Blend's position, yet the man who cast it knew nothing of the soldier's proximity. 
Blend rose in silence behind him and made a series of hand gestures intended for Picker. The old man continued on unawares. When he was but a half dozen paces away, Picker straightened and leveled her crossbow. She growled, far enough, traveler. Quick reminder here that we have met Picker before, although very briefly. <laughs> she was the only Marine in the barracks in Pale when Ganoes showed up in Gardens of the Moon. It was a funny exchange, and she promptly put her own foot in her mouth when he told her that he was Captain Perrin. She said, oh, you're the new captain who's yet to pull a sword, eh? <laughs> And she was also one of the people that found him after he got shanked by Sari. Yes, that's right. And again, I love the start of this because we have a lot of intros in this one. And these, I love these two. They're hilarious. And in particular, this chapter, we get some great comment back and forth. That's beautiful. It is. Erickson's mastery of, is he a Monty Python guy or is he a Farrelly Brothers guy? What kind of humor does he like? Is he a full orb humor? Is it, I'm curious what he's into. I'm trying to think of the best way to classify it. The soldier's humor has always been the stuff that I gravitated to. Yes. And I think we've talked about this before where it is his ability to take the seriousness and cut it with these little interludes of comedy that are largely driven by the soldiers, though there are some other characters later on that we're introduced to that are crazy funny. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of some in Midnight Tides that are introduced. Oh, my word. Okay, yes, sir. <laughs> I was just thinking about them today for some reason. I was thinking about last week's episode, though. I did mispronounce Krupp's name. I said Kruppa, oh. and we've heard that Mr. Erickson calls it Krupp, so Krupp. I need to remember in this book to continue with that pronunciation. Yes. Okay. The old man's surprise sent him stumbling back a step. A stone turned underfoot and he pitched to the ground, crying out yet managing to twist to avoid landing atop the leather pack strapped to his back. He skidded another pace down the trail and found himself almost at Blend's feet. Picker smiled, stepped forward. She said, that'll do. You don't look dangerous, old fella, but just in case, there's five other crossbows trained on you right now. So how about you tell me what in Hood's name you're doing here? Sweat and dust stained the old man's threadbare tunic. His sunburned forehead was broad over a narrow set of features, vanishing into an almost chinless jaw. His naggled, crooked teeth jutted out in all directions. He pulled his thin, leather-wrapped legs under himself and slowly levered upright. He gasped, a thousand apologies, then glanced over his shoulder at Blend. He flinched at what he saw in her eyes, swung hastily back to face Picker and said, I thought this trail untenanted, even by thieves. You see, my life savings are invested in what I carry. I could not afford a guard, nor even a mule. Picker drawled, you're a traitor then. Bound where? The old man said, Pale, I'm from Darujistan. Picker snapped, that's obvious enough. Thing is, Pale is now in Imperial hands, as are these hills. The old man said, I did not know about these hills, that is. Of course, I'm aware that Pale has entered the Malazan embrace. Picker grinned at Blend and said, hear that? An embrace. <laughs> That's a good one, old man. A motherly hug, right? What's in the sack then? The old man said, I'm an artisan, a, a carver of small trinkets, bone, ivory, jade, serpentine. Picker asked, anything invested, spells and the like, anything blessed? The old man said, only by my talents to answer your first query. I am no mage and I work alone. I was fortunate, however, in acquiring a priest's blessings on a set of three ivory torques. Picker asked, what god? The old man said, Treach, the tiger of summer. Picker sneered, that's not a god, you fool. Treach is a first hero, a demigod, a soul-taken ascendant. The old man interrupted, a new temple has been sanctified in his name, on the street of the hairless ape in the Gadrobi quarter. I myself was hired to punch the leather binding for the book of prayers and rituals. Street of the hairless ape. I want to hear the other street names in the Gadrobi district. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure that it beats the old American ones where it's always, you know, first, second, and third, and then always A, B, and C, like for your core street names. I'm sure there's some interesting ones in there. I'm sure there's some really, really vulgar ones in there, too, I'm assuming. I'm wondering what the basis of the hairless ape is, though. It's a good question. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think we'll ever get an answer. <laughs> I'm sure we will. It's always the throwaway stuff. You're like me. It's always the throwaway stuff that always is like, that's what makes it so good. What? What did you just say? It, the it, hairless it, ape? What? It, it's always those small ones that always, they leave this weird, like, Okay, I gotta find. What is this about, man? It's got mm -hmm. you going that way. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, he's got some backstory for it. Oh, I'm sure. 
I'm sure that there's something that has to do with that. Oh, do you think it, I'm sure it's some reference to something they've done or role played or something that probably yes. had them crying in tears, I'm sure. It's an inside joke. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming. Good call. Picker rolled her eyes and lowered the crossbow. She said, all right, let's see these torques then. With an eager nod, the old man unslung his pack and set it down before him. He released the lone strap. Picker grunted, Remember, if you pull out anything awry, you'll get a dozen quarrels airing your skull. The old man murmured, This is a pack, not my breeches. <laughs> Besides, I thought it was five. Picker scowled. He caught on pretty quick. He called her yeah. out on that. <laughs> you gotta watch out for the Malaza Marines, dude. Oh, they're too funny. <laughs> Glenn quietly said, Our audience has grown. Picker hastily added, That's right! Two whole squads <laughs> hiding, watching your every move. With exaggerated caution, the old man drew forth a small packet of twine-wrapped doe skin. With reverence, he said, the ivory is said to be ancient, from a furred, tusked monster that was once Treach's favored prey. The beast's corpse was found in the mud in distant Ellengarth. Picker snapped, never mind all that. Let's see these damn things. Quick note here. Geographically, Ellengarth is on the southern coast of Genebacus. If you follow the coast south from Morn, which is where Talk came out and met Tool, mm -hmm. the coast will curve into an easterly direction, and you will eventually hit Ellengarth. Is that ivory from the same things that were trapped in the mud that we saw at the beginning? Oh, could very well be. Okay. It just now dawned on me. I, I think I, when, I, when I was reading through that, I thought, I got to remember that. And I forgot that till I saw it here. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to say, I got to remember that. Because I'm like, wow, that was really set up. Okay, so I'm thinking back to the animals that were trapped. We thought of them likely as caribou-esque, some type yes. of animal like that. When I think tusked, and given it's on the coast, I was thinking more walrus or narwhal-esque. Granted, okay. Treach isn't going to be fishing for narwhal, but well, you kind of get my point, right? Some type I, of tusked animal yeah. that lives on the beach. I got the mammoth vibe when I think tusks for some reason. I always think of tus the ivory tusk, a mammoth tusk for some reason. Yeah, it could possibly be something like a woolly mammoth. Okay. Anything like that. But yeah, I think that may be what was, it wouldn't be a fish. It'd be more of an upright animal if it was, was surrounded by some animals that were trapped in this mud with it. That looked like they were stalking the prey trapped in the mud and they got trapped in the mud with it. The A and the, it mentioned what they were. I can't remember what they were, but I was just curious if that would be the same ivory. That would be kind of intriguing if it was. If they have ivory. Right. Sure. Yeah. Now that you mention it, the fact that they're trapped in mud, likely it's not on the coast. It's probably more inland, marshy stuff, which doesn't lend itself to a walrus type thing. So you're probably on the right track there. Okay. The trader's white, wiry eyebrows rose in alarm. He said, damned? No, not ever. You think I would sell cursed items? Picker said, be quiet. It was just a damned expression. <laughs> Hurry up. We haven't got all damn day. Blen made a sound, quickly silenced by a glare from Picker. <laughs> oh, it's like, who's on first with these guys? Uh-huh. <laughs> I could see Blen just huffing in the background like, yeah, okay, sure. We're sitting here all day doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. The old man unwrapped the packet, revealing three upper arm rings, each of one piece and undecorated, polished to a gleaming pale luster. Picker asked, where's the blessing marks? The old man said, none. They were each in turn wrapped within a cloth woven from Treach's own molt hair for nine days and ten nights. Blend snorted. Picker's face twisted. She said, molt hair? What a disgusting thought. I'm sure there's a cat joke in here somewhere. The only cat jokes I got are hairball jokes. I don't know any, but I mean, it would have to be something hairball related. You know how they have those furminator brushes where you get the fur off the animals, whether it's a yes. dog or a cat, you brush them. Yeah. There is a possibility you could take your cat hair and weave it into a yarn. Sure. And then knit something from, sure. from it. <laughs> I know that I've seen somebody somewhere. I can't remember what it was on. It was some i can't good gracious it, let's just say youtube for all intents and purposes but a woman they used her dog hair to make yarn so wash it i'm sure it's fine i guess you know just get all the dander out of it you're fine <laughs> so somebody ferminated treach is that what you're saying i guess so i, I guess so that's all i got <laughs> oh, oh that's a stretch yes i'm yeah, sorry yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In response to Picker, Blend murmured, Spindle wouldn't think so. And this is something we don't really have a frame of reference on yet. We'll mm. come back to this later. <laughs> Picker said, a set of three arm torques, right arm, left arm, then where? And watch your mouth, we're delicate flowers, Blend in me. 
The old man said, all for one arm. They are solid, yet they interlock. Such was the instruction of the blessing. Picker said, interlocking, yet seamless. This I have to see. The old man said, I cannot, alas, demonstrate this sorcery, for it will occur but once, when the purchaser has threaded them onto his or her weapon arm. Picker said, now that has swindle written all over it. Blen said, well, we got him right here. Cheats only work if you can make a clean getaway. Picker said, like in Pale's crowded markets. Well, indeed, we're not in a crowded market, are we? How much? The trader squirmed as he said, you have selected my most valued work. I'd intended an auction for these. Picker again asked, how much, old man? The old man stammered, Th 300 g gold councils. Picker said, councils. That's Darujistan's new coinage, isn't it? Blen said, Pales adopted the Malazan Jakarta as standard weight. What's the exchange? Picker muttered, damned if I know. The old man said, if you please, the exchange in Darujistan is two and one third Jakartas to one council. Broker's fees comprise at least one Jakarta. Thus, strictly speaking, one and a third. That is a steep fee. 43%. Wow. Bank of America charges a flat rate of seven fifty for <laughs> currency orders of less than a thousand dollars. So unless you're exchanging more than seventeen twenty-five of currency, it it will be cheaper. So that's kind of the break-even point. But right. that's really crazy. Yes, we don't have forty-three percent rates for the privilege of exchanging something. That's just the yes. transaction fee. That's yes, <laughs> that's yeah. Crazy. And you gotta really want to use that money. It's like <laughs> it's like my word. You I don't, don't think really you have, have a choice. I was going to say, you don't yeah. have an option. They got you over the barrel, I guess. Mm -hmm. Quite literally. It kind of makes me think if that's how it works in places like Argentina or Venezuela, where the currency of the land is so devalued that the people that are exchanging into something like U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. I wonder what type of exchange rates they're running. Because they're not using the standard exchange rates that we use at our banks. It's kind of a black market scenario. Yes. That's what I'm assuming. But a lot of people do transact in, in U.S. dollars there because it doesn't get devalued as quickly. Yeah, that's true. It's all run by the local black markets, I'm assuming, who are paying kickbacks. That's why they got to charge that 40-something. They got to pay the kickback to somebody who's paying kickbacks to somebody who's paying kickbacks to somebody. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what the rate of inflation of the Malazan Jakarta is. Do you think they have a central bank that's printing money? <laughs> got some stimulation going on. <laughs> If they're smart, gotta, gotta fund was, that uh, next campaign in seven uh, cities. Let's print three uh, trillion jakatas. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the jakata and all their money seems to be actual physical metal. They have not adopted the foolish paper currency model of the West oh, and of, of the modern world. So you know, they're true. at least they're at least safe. With they're the on the gold face. standard. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. kind of on the gold standard. So okay, they're a little bit safer. Um, That's a with good that. point. Yeah, gold, bronze, silver. You got something. Good call out. That would be funny. It's funny to imagine that, though. <laughs> Especially with what's going on right now. It's just, mm. you know, it's just too funny. Blend shifted her weight, leaned forward for a closer look at the torques. She said, 300 councils would keep a family comfortable for a couple years at least. The old man said, such was my goal. Although, as I live alone and modestly, I anticipated four or more years, including materials for my craft. Anything less than 300 councils and I would be ruined. Picker said, my heart weeps. She glanced over at Blend and asked, who will miss it? Blend shrugged. Picker said, rustle up three columns then. Blend said, at once, Corporal, and stepped past the old man, moved silently up the trail, then out of sight. The old man whined, I beg you, do not pay me in Jakartas. <laughs> we don't want your currency. Picker said, calm down. Opon's smiling on you today. Now step away from the pack. I'm obliged to search it. Bowing, the old man backed up and said, the rest is of lesser value, I admit. Indeed, somewhat rushed. Picker said, I'm not looking to buy anything else, as she rummaged with one hand through the pack. She said, this is official now. The old man said, ah, I see. Are some trade items now forbidden in pale? Picker said, counterfeit jakatas for one. Local <laughs> economy's taking a beating, and Darujistan councils aren't much welcome either. We've had quite a haul this past week. The trader's eyes widened. He asked, you will pay me in counterfeited coin? Picker said, tempting, but no. Like I said, Opon's winked your way. Finished with her search, Picker stepped back and pulled out a small wax tablet from her belt pouch. She said, I need to record your name, trader. It's mostly smugglers using these trails, trying to avoid the post at the plains track through the divide. You're one of the few honest ones, it seems. Those clever smugglers end up paying for their cleverness tenfold on these here trails, when the truth is they'd have a better chance slipping through the chaos at the post. 
The old man said, I am named Munug. Pigger glanced up and said, you poor bastard. <laughs> she sure doesn't sugarcoat anything. This takes me right back to when she met Perrin. She told him the money was on him only lasting two days as the new captain before he died with That's his right. own blood on his hands. I believe I need to use this next time I meet someone with a strange name. But with her in particular, I think this is why... If I'm not mistaken, I think Perrin kind of likes her in some aspect, not not in a like like, but just he surrounds himself with the people that would still like it is. And the bridge burners will most assuredly tell you like it is, but she more so <laughs> than others will seem to tell you like it is, but really doesn't even try to code it at all. You know, it's like okay. Blend returned down the trail, three wrapped columns of coins cradled in her arms. The trader shrugged sheepishly, his eyes on the wrapped coin stacks. He said, Those are councils. Pigger muttered, I, in hundred columns. You'll probably throw your back lugging them to pale, not to mention back again. In fact, you needn't bother making the trip at all now, right? She fixed him with her eyes as she put the tablet back into the pouch. Munug said, you have a valid point. He rewrapped the torques and passed the packet to Blend, then said, I shall journey to pale nonetheless, to deal the rest of my work. Eyes shifting nervously, he bared his crooked teeth in a weak smile. He said, if Opon's luck holds, I might well double my take. Picker studied the man a moment longer, then shook her head. She said, greed never pays, Munug. I'd lay a wager that in a month's time you'll come wending back down this trail with nothing but dust in your pockets. What say you, ten councils? Munug said, if I lose, you'd have me ten in debt to you. Picker said, ah, oh, well, I'd consider a trinket or three instead. You've skilled hands, old man, no question of that. Munug said, thank you, but I respectfully decline the wager. Picker shrugged and said, too bad. You've another bell of daylight. There's a wayside camp up near the summit. If you're determined enough, you might reach it before sunset. Munug said, I shall make the endeavor. He slung his arms through the pack straps, grunted upright, then, with a hesitant nod, moved past Picker. Picker commanded, hold on there. Munug's knees seemed to weaken, and he almost collapsed. He stammered, y yes Picker took the torques from Blend and said, I've got to put these on first. Interlocking you claimed, but seamless. Munug said, oh, yes, of course. By all means, proceed. Picker rolled back the sleeve of her dusty shirt, revealing, in the heavy wool's underside, its burgundy dye. Munug's gasp was audible. Picker smiled and said, that's right, we're bridge burners. Amazing what dust disguises, eh? She worked the ivory rings up her scarred, muscled arm. Between her biceps and shoulder, there was a soft click. Frowning, Picker studied the three torques, then hissed in surprise. I'll be damned. Munug's smile broadened for the briefest of moments. Then he bowed slightly and asked, may I now resume my journey? Picker said, go on, barely paying him any further attention, her eyes studying the gleaming torques on her arm. Blen stared after the man for a full minute, a faint frown wrinkling her dusty brow. Munug found the side cut in the path a short while later. Glancing back down the trail to confirm for at least the tenth time that he was not followed, he quickly slipped between the two tilting stones that framed the hidden entrance. The gloomy passage ended after a half dozen paces, opening out onto a track winding through a high-walled fissure. Shadow swallowed him as he scurried down it. Sunset was less than a hundred heartbeats away, he judged. The delay with the bridge burners could prove fatal if he failed to make the appointment. He whispered, after all, gods are not known for forgiving natures. The coins were heavy. His heart thumped hard in his chest. He wasn't used to such strenuous efforts. He was an artisan, after all. Down on his luck of late, perhaps. Weakened by the tumors between his legs, no doubt. But his talent and vision had, if anything, grown sharper for all the grief and pain he'd suffered. He remembered what the god had said. I have chosen you for those very flaws, Munug. That and your skills, of course. Oh yes, I have great need of your skills. A god's blessing would surely take care of those tumors. And, if not, then 300 councils would come close to paying for a Danul healer's treatment back in Darujistan. After all, it wasn't wise to trust solely in a god's payment for services. Munug's tale to the bridge burners about an auction in Pale was true enough. It paid to fashion options, to map out fallback plans, and while sculpting and carving were his lesser skills, he was not so modest as to deny the high quality of his work. Of course, there was nothing compared to his painting. He thought, as nothing, nothing at all. He hastened along the track, ignoring the preternatural mists that closed in around him. Ten paces later, as he passed through the Warren's Gate, the clefts and crags of the East Talon Hills disappeared entirely, the mists thinning to reveal a featureless stony plain beneath a sickly sky. Further out on the plain sat a ragged hide tent, smoke hanging over it in a sea-blue haze. Munnag hurried towards it. 
chest laboring, he crouched down before the entrance and scratched on the flap covering it. A ragged cough sounded from within, then a voice rasped, Enter, mortal. Munag crawled in. Thick, acrid smoke assaulted his eyes, nostrils, and throat, but after his first breath, a cool numbness spread out from his lungs. Keeping his head lowered and eyes averted, Munug stopped just within the entrance and waited. The god said, You are late, wheezing with each breath. Munug said, Soldiers on the trail, master. The god asked, Did they discover it? Munug smiled down at the dirty rushes on the tent floor and said, No, they searched my pack, as I knew they would, but not my person. The god coughed again, and Munug heard a scrape as the brazier was drawn across the floor. Seeds popped on his coals, and the smoke thickened. The god said, Show me. Munug reached into the folds of his threadbare tunic and drew forth a thick, book-sized package. He unwrapped it to reveal a stack of wooden cards. Head still lowered and working blind, Munug pushed the cards toward the god, splaying them out as he did so. He heard the god's breath catch, then a soft rustle. When it spoke again, the voice was closer. It asked, Flaws? Munug said, Aye, master, one for each card, as you instructed. The god said, Ah, this pleases me. Mortal, your skill is unsurpassed. Truly, these are images of pain and imperfection. They are tortured, fraught with anguish. They assault the eye and bleed the heart. More, I see chronic loneliness in such faces as you have fashioned within the scenes. Dry amusement entered its tone. It said, You have painted your own soul, mortal. Munnig said, I have known little happiness, mast. The god hissed, Nor should you expect it. Not in this life, not in the thousand others you are doomed to endure before you attain salvation, assuming you have suffered enough to have earned it. Munnig mumbled, I beg that there be no release in my suffering, master. Man, what kind of prayer <laughs> who would in their right mind say those words first off i was gonna say who does this can you imagine if we saw this on the screen you'd have to have one of those moments like where it's like palpatine or somebody not that kind of voice but it's where they've just treated it with all that you know super heavy sub bass where you know it would be like lies <laughs> dream of comfort it, 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 where it just shakes you down to your interior you know it's like it's got to sound like that but yes who says i beg there to be no release in, in my suffering master it's like hmm, I, I i i don't think i like that it's like wait what it's like <laughs> yeah i just realized something though when you brought up star wars here the crippled god is not unlike Darth Vader, from the mm -hmm. perspective that without his suit, he is in eternal pain, mm -hmm. his lungs are scarred, he has to be breathing in whatever the suit is providing him to keep him alive. That's yeah. a crazy comparison. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I just, I, thank the Lord we didn't cross the streams that one with, with some spice. Could you imagine Vader on spice? Wow. Th <laughs> that's Jack scary. Is, that's a really scary thought, isn't it? He's basically the Queezax Hatterack. Yeah. 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 <laughs> of the Star Wars. Oh, my word. I'm just, uh, now I'm going to just send it to you, but I just, it was on Instagram. I watched this guy comparing Harry Potter to Star Wars. It was like, oh my gosh. There, it's like, it's a complete ripoff of Star Wars in, in every single way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's not gonna, I have to send it to you. It's, I don't know Harry Potter. I know Star Wars, but I know enough of the references, and it's really funny. I'll see. I'll I'll find it. Send it to you. I'm thinking through the characters in Harry Potter and equating them well, to Star Wars characters. About the, the Han, you got the Han reference. The Han's the scruffy friend, and you got the Ron, Hermione, you, and you, then Hermione's it, Leia. It's, yeah, is is the Leia character? And who's Hagrid? Got, I'm not sure who they are, but you're talking Chewbacca? about the old, you've got the old stoner guy that's basically like Yoda, and so I don't know who it's. A, you got Yoda equals some old stoner guy who gets full, full of wisdom, at, and he basically says, "Matt, if somebody says you know he's got the uncle and aunt that are just like Ben and Beiru, it's everything." Personally, I think I've always told you I thought she was. I thought she ripped off Tim Hunter's books of magic which is a, a, an offshoot of John Constantine of the DC universe. Mm -hmm. To me, it's such a blatant ripoff down to the imagery of what Harry looks like. So it's a young English boy raised by aunt and uncle who happens to be one of the only true wielders of magic. Most people like Constantine wield magic in a ritual style, but nobody's born with it. He's one of the only humans born with magic in the DC universe, Tim Hunter is. And to me, I feel like Harry Potter's are straight up rip off of that. So. Anyhow. Wow. We jumped four yeah, we franchises. Did. Yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> wow. Dune, Star Wars, um, Harry Potter. What else? I'm so sorry. Constantine. Constantine, yes. 
and Tim Hunter. Five. <laughs> five. Sorry, that's actually five franchises, brother. No. Wow. Is, Is that, that a record? record? I don't know. It's if we've a, ever... that nice in stereo. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> amazing i think it is I, uh, that's amazing wow i would love to continue sub-referencing the only person that could sub-reference better is dennis miller okay you could probably jump to anything in six steps sure. just like the six degrees to kevin bacon thing right but you, the problem that we have in our in our love of this is why the malazan rules because the malazan takes everything that we know and love and does like the ultimate mashup somehow I don't know how he does it, but it's like the ultimate mashup in a weird way. But when you look at fantasy, it's always, for the most part, you have the selected hero with the selected power singled out by the selected villain. There's so little variation in theme. And that cross, I mean, Star Wars might as well be any other type of type of show like that in a way. It's straight up fantasy. It's more science fantasy than science fiction. I mean, do they whoosh through space? Didn't he say it was kind of a, like a Western story? It's a Western version of, Yo. well, first off, what up is a straight up hidden fortress? Oh, right, right. I forget which one. I, I think it's the first one. Star Wars Episode Four is Hidden Fortress, I believe. It's some way. I've not seen the Kira Kurosawa films. I've just been, I, he's just kind of the Westernized idea of them. I don't know. All right. Okay, move along, sir. Moving along. <laughs> Gracious. After Munug mumbled, I beg that there be no release in my suffering, Master, <laughs> which I still can't believe he said. Right. The god said, lies! You dream of comfort and contentment. You carry the gold that you believe will achieve it, and you mean to prostitute your talent to achieve yet more. Do not deny sure. this, mortal. I know your soul. I see its avidness and yearning here in these images. Fear not, such emotions amuse me, for they are the paths to despair. Munug said, yes, Master. The god said, now, Munug of Darujistan, your payment. Munug screamed as fire blossomed within the tumors between his legs. Twisting with agony, he curled up tight on the filthy rushes. This is one of my core memories from this book. For whatever reason, this really bothered me. <laughs> it left quite the impression on me. And from a visual perspective, this is funny that you brought up Constantine just now. The way I visualize this is kind of at the end of the movie in Constantine when mm -hmm. Satan's pulling the cancer out of his lungs. Sure. That's kind of how I visualized it. Right. It's a little bit of a different scenario because he's curing him. And I guess in this, he's curing him too. Kind of. Yeah, sure. He is. I've already talked enough about Constantine. I'm not going to be smirch. I love Keanu Reeves. I do not like the Constantine movie. So I will let it go with that. <laughs> okay. So as an outsider that has not read the Constantine books, mm -hmm. I enjoy the movie. Okay. Did you ever watch the TV show? I did not. The TV show was done by the people that brought us Hannibal. Okay. It was the closest thing I think that you would ever come to the truest version of Constantine with the truest version of the actor playing him. So much so the actor was held over for two or three years and they brought him, the only way to bring Constantine back was to bring him over to the CW's terrible show, Legends of Tomorrow. And they brought him back as Constantine, but they kept the same, he was actually the voice actor, the same guy that's in uh, Assassin's Creed three or four. I forget which one. He was one of the assassins. All right, we should move on. But I just thought move it was on. funny that you mentioned Constantine just a minute ago and I was thinking of it here. It's because I saw your note down here earlier i incepted you you did you incepted me sir it's your fault <laughs> i'm letting that go though. you know what i will take responsibility for okay. these digressions all right billy <laughs> it's on me it's on me because that's the hey, type of person i am okay i accept responsibility i am like michael pena's character from ant-man you put the dime in you gotta you just i'm sorry you put the dime in you gotta wind him up he just goes i just uh -huh. go i'm sorry i can't help it <laughs> It can't be helped. I did like that character. That was a funny character. <laughs> it is. The god laughed, the horrible sound breaking into lung-ravaging coughs that were long and passing. The pain, Munug realized after a while, was fading. The god said, you are healed, mortal. You are granted more years of your miserable life. Alas, <laughs> as perfection is anathema to me, so it must be among my cherished children. Munug stammered, my master, I cannot feel my legs. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. Wow, it's rough. Did I do it bad? Should I no, re no? That live? I'm just, I'm just, it's, it's an awful thing to do to that old boy. It's like that gum. It's just like you know. It's like yes, you're healed, and now you're crippled. It's like, it's like what? What? Yeah. It's like I did. I did you the solid master. I did what I said I was going to do. At least he didn't take his money. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but in some ways, that makes it harder for him right now. Yes, it. Does. 
<laughs> it's yeah. gonna cost him those 300 councils just buying his ride back to yeah. Garuja's stand, isn't it? You know? It's gonna be horrible. Let's talk about that in a minute. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be laughing at this poor guy. Yeah, yeah. Know. He can't we feel his he, legs. He's already like, got a bad name. I mean, it's like, dude. It's <laughs> Billy, it's supposed to be serious. And you're making, <laughs> he's got a horrible name. Just had his legs stolen from him. <laughs> but he did ask to prolong his suffering endlessly. He, <laughs> he did. He did he, ask he, for this. He, in fact, asked for this. So at least he's still alive. Oh, I mean, it's like, so does he wish to stay alive to suffer? Then he's got his wish. Does he wish to yeah. die and suffer? I don't know. I would rather, I don't know. I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. I was talking to my oldest son about spinal injuries. Mm -hmm. And he was asking me what I thought life would be like if I was a quadriplegic. And that'd be real hard for me because I really like to exercise. Yeah. So that'd be real difficult Yeah. beyond the obvious other stuff, right? Not being able to do something that you enjoy so much. You would become a cogitator. Sure. <laughs> I'm just still sticking with <laughs> you would not you'd be a Cymac and not a cogitator. You I was gonna it. say, am I supposed to become a Cymac? Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking that exact thing. Yeah. <laughs> that was it's like that's your that's your next dream anyhow. It wasn't it was like the step up to ascendancy to use through a Cymac. I don't know, man. Cause I think about <laughs> analog versus digital. And let's say <laughs> we get into the scenario where you do have the ability to take your brain out and put it in something else. <laughs> Nothing is ever going to be the equivalent of here's the best example of this that I can think of. When I would go offshore, you would see the most beautiful sunrises and sunsets and you would try and take these pictures, even if it's a panoramic shot and yeah. it never no. recreates the majesty no. No, of actually being there. And I don't think you could, no matter what kind of sensors you have, get to a point where you digitally can oh, okay. recreate well, what the human body is capable of doing on its own you're right but it's like I, i've just never equated my life as being analog it's like hmm, i like that it's like it's a very funny thought but it's like that's true we are very analog critters aren't we <laughs> do you think that's the right way to describe it i think it's it's the most perfect way I've ever heard to describe anything in my life. It was like, I was just like, wow, that just really hit home so hard. I couldn't stop laughing. Dude. We are absolute. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Okay. I agree. Move along, sir. <laughs> we are analog critters. So after Munug stammers that he can't feel his legs, the God said, they are dead. I am afraid. Such was the price of curing. It seems, artisan, that you will have a long, wearying crawl to wherever it is you seek to go. <laughs> Bear in mind, child, that the value lies in the journey, not in the goal achieved. The god laughed again, triggering yet another fit of coughing. So if a journey of a thousand steps begins with the first <laughs> step... <laughs> Billy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dude, this would be an excruciating... I, I say it would be excruciating he can't feel his legs but trying to do an army crawl without your Walmart, legs with these gracious. coins in your pack would be extremely difficult what do you think the coins are probably like 50 to 75 pounds kind of like that just straight up uh, you know almost 100 pounds of gold you're lugging along and yeah Glenn was having of... trouble carrying them they were yeah, heavy to her oh, and she's yeah. a soldier i'm thinking they're a minimum of 40 to 50 pounds yeah yeah good gracious that's a and he's old and frail, yeah. and now he doesn't have legs. <laughs> Rubbish, I haven't touched a drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, this guy's in a tough spot. Oh, my word, yes. We've said it before, but beware the gods bearing gifts, especially this god. Yeah, I had forgot that he healed them and crippled them. And yes, this is any time that we see this feller, the crippled god, it's always core to me. It always stands out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> is such an iconic scene with the tent mm -hmm. and yes. the brazier the seeds Seed. going on the, <laughs> the smoke. smoke yes it's horrifying dude it's like it's i always imagine it's like vader's chamber you know when he when, when, the, yes. when the guy comes in and finds vader without the helmet on and he's like horrified he's standing there what do i do do i stand up do i say something does he know i'm here it's like you know you don't you don't say anything it's like you say nothing sir and so and then he's always coughing yeah always yeah. hacking and brutal i forget how tough it's it's never like you know just kind of like a light cough no it's always like tortured coughing yeah the guy was torn apart as he fell to the planet 
Then he was crippled and chained in place in eternal agony for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. (laughs) And now he's the most (laughs) negative Nancy you can imagine. He's heard it. (laughs) All he knows is vitriol. Yeah. Knowing he was dismissed, Munug pulled himself around, dragged the dead weight of his lower limbs through the tent entrance, then lay gasping. Didn't even leave him a cart to pull him along with. It's it's (laughs) Billy. He wants him to suffer. I know. But that's suffering. In fact, that's still, I mean. What's he going to do with a cart? He's on a mountain trail. Dude, he can like, like, have you seen the videos of the turtle on the skateboard? No. It's like a little bitty turtle in the house, and he. And they stick a little bitty kid's toy skateboard underneath this, and it's like all of a sudden his flap is with his flappers. This dude cruises around the, and follows this cat around the house, man. It's like it's real. Yeah, it's real. Wow, it's, yeah, it's weird. It's <laughs> he cruises along pretty good, man. Interesting. It's quite interesting. We we so so I'm thinking he could lay on his belly. I mean, that's it's sure it's not the greatest, but something he could pull it behind him if it had no wheels. To eat, you know, so, so he doesn't have the weight of the gold directly on him. I don't know. So, I don't think that God is interested in making this journey any easier no, for him. No, there's no, there's no convenience. Yeah. <laughs> convenience is anathema to this entity. The pain Munug now felt came from his own soul. He pulled his pack up alongside him, rested his head on it. The columns of stacked coins were hard against his sweat runnelled forehead. He whispered, my rewards. Blessed is the touch of the fallen one. Lead me, dear master, down the paths of despair, for I deserve this world's pain in unending bounty. Okay, Professor Chaos. <laughs> From the tent behind him, the crippled god's laughter hacked the air. It said, cherish this moment, dear Munug. By your hand, the new game is begun. By your hand, the world shall tremble. Munug closed his eyes and said, my rewards. Mm. What an intro to the crippled god. Yeah. Dude, what a villain. This is how you introduce a villain. Yeah. You know, it's equivalent to Vader force choking that guy. Where are the plans? I forget exactly what Vader says when he chokes that guy out, but it's like, that's how you introduce a villain right there. Yeah. All in black, choking someone out. Pretty much the same thing. Heals a guy, then then breaks his spine, basically. It says, get out. And enjoy the crawl back. That scene in Rogue One, though, in that hallway. Mm. Dude. At the end of the movie, yeah. If they had had that level of intensity back in the day people mm. would have i mean they already lost their minds but Dude. think about what a villain he i mean he was already an iconic villain but that's just you have to understand that i was seven you know it's kind of like where were you at 9-11 i know where was it i know where was the first time i sat down and watched episode four i know what it was like i still remember I'm not much else but that when that thing comes over the, the star destroyer comes into the screen it's like every man in that building became a little boy <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> like, and i still feel like that every time that opening scene plays i still feel like that guy i'm like Whoa, what, what? <laughs> i imagine that'd be quite a bit of nostalgia oh, to have yes. experienced that back in the day i think for me my similar experience would probably be jurassic park okay. that's probably the closest thing i could equate that to of how revolutionary that was at the time compared yeah. to everything else before it because i was in the sixth grade when it came out okay yeah that's cool that was the first one where they had that cgi yeah dinosaurs which still looks amazing today it looks you good. compare it to some of the stuff they're doing nowadays and in some cases it looks better i don't know what's what people are doing with some of their cgi their budgets aren't that great i don't know the problem is this or, or for me with cgi and the real you have to you need a con you need a blending of both mm-hmm you need some real i'm sorry practical there we go you need practical to give your brain something to feel is real to build the cg on that's for me at least how i feel is best enhanced or best used okay can cgi be diegetic or non-diegetic i don't believe so (laughs) whether it's practical or non i don't know if that would be the case it's, it's some equivalency. I'm sure that there's something. I'm sure there's something there that there's a, there's a line of crossing. All right, let's move on. We have digressed an extreme amount tonight. Oh my, well, this is true. <laughs> well, we're just starting the book. I'm sorry, we're setting the pace. This happens, people. I need to go back and check the openings to the uh, the other two and see. Do we get this same kind of, or do I just get? Is it just me? Some days we're just on a roll and we can't stop ourselves. It's, it's just what it's, it is. It's what it is. It's what it is. Yeah. Blen continued staring up the trail long after the traitor had disappeared from view. She muttered, he was not as he seemed. Picker said, none of them are, as she tugged at the torx on her arm. She said, these things are damn tight. Blen said, your arm will probably rot and fall off, Corporal. 
Pigger looked up with wide eyes and asked, you think they're cursed? <laughs> she should have thought of that before she put them on. <laughs> Dude, that is such a rookie Tunnels of Doom move. Uh, Tunnels of Doom was this, I've, I've, I've probably explained this game. It's like the first, I never had a chance to play D&D with anyone. But it was my Texas Instruments computer was my game console. And it had a turn-based game where it dug a, this tunnels. And it had cursed items. And if you equipped them, because if you if sometimes I was bold, I'm like, you know what, it's I'm, I'm kind of down low, you know, and it's and usually it was a pretty good 50 50 down the deeper you get that it's going to be cursed. And you're like, man, my guy's dying. I've been, been slogging through this last bit few rooms. You're like, I've got to do it. And you do it. You're like, oh, no, it's like it, increased, <laughs> it, it increases your counters by like 70 percent. You're like, no, no. It's like I'm already like at one hit point left. And you're like, oh, boy. Oh, no. So <laughs> talk about risk versus reward. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a, such the same move right here. It's like, dude. <laughs> Blend shrugged and said, if it was me, I'd have Quick Ben take a good long peer at them, and sooner, not later. Picker said, Tog's balls. If you'd had a suspicion, Blend said, didn't say I did, Corporal. It was you complaining they were tight. Can you get them off? Picker scowled and said, no, damn you. Blend said, oh, and looked away. <laughs> Tog's balls. That's a new one we haven't heard before. I'm yes. used to hearing Tog's teats. Yes. Well, we have different soldiers, different swearing. We'll follow suit. True. <laughs> What's well, is funny because I thought Tog's teats meant that that was the female. Right. But apparently Tog is the male. I guess males have teats as well. Well, technically. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a meet the parents nipples, reference here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm always, I'm sorry, I don't remember the Meet the Parents reference. I'm thinking of time bandits. I've got time bandits going on. Ben Stiller said he milked the cat. Oh! And he said, uh, they're like, you can milk a cat? And he said, you can milk anything with nipples. And the dad says, I have nipples. Can you milk me? You know, that was Robert De Niro right. intimidating oh, right. him. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That is a great oh. joke. Oh, okay. I, can, I need to watch. It's been a while. That's a very, that's an uncomfortable movie, my word. It's typical Ben Stiller. Oh, let's torment Ben. Flagellating for, himself for, for 90 minutes. Hours. <laughs> Picker contemplated giving Blend a good hard cuff, but it was a thought she entertained at least 10 times a day since they'd paired up for this posting. <laughs> and once again, she resisted it. She said 300 councils to buy my arm falling off. Wonderful. Blen said, think positive, Corporal. It'll give you something to talk about with Dujek. <laughs> That's dark. <laughs> I didn't realize what she was saying until just now, because Dujek oh has Lord. one arm. <laughs> yeah, yes. I just knock on that, too. That's bad, man. <laughs> oh, good gracious. That's bad burn. That's, that's insulting to Dujek. That is so insulting to Dujek. Oh, my Lord. Said, I really do hate you, Blake. <laughs> Amazing banter with these two uh, right off the bat. Oh, you know, it's some of the funniest banter in the series, if I recall, is from these two, or usually Quick and Kalam or somebody something with Fiddler got some lit, but it's I, I it's it's not Quick Ben and Kalam and Fiddler are not necessarily funny. Mm -hmm. Quick's kind of funny, but these I think are some of the funnier ones. This group of bridge burners is the funnier bunch on this side. Yeah, well, I don't want to jump too far ahead. Yeah, we've seen a little bit. You know, you're going to see Spindle here mm -hmm. uh, and some other Hedge. Very, very, yes. Oh, Hedge. We had some great and then uh, what's the bar gas name? Trots. Trots, of course, is Trots is a yeah. long time favorite yeah. man. Great bar gas. Blend offered Picker a bland smile and said, so did you drop a pebble in that old man's pack then? Picker said, aye. He was fidgety enough to warrant it. He damn near fainted when I called him back, didn't he? Blend nodded. Pigger said, so, Quick Ben tracks him. Blend said, unless he cleans out his pack. Pigger grunted, he cared less about what was in it than I did. No, whatever serious booty he carried was under his shirt, no doubt about it. Anyway, he'll be sure to put out the word when he gets to pale. The traffic of smugglers through these hills will drop right off. Mark my words, and I'll lay coin on that wager. And I threw him the line about better chances at the divide when you was off collecting the councils. Blend's smile broadened. She said, chaos at the crossroads, eh? The only chaos Perrin's crew has over there is what to do with all the takings. Picker said, let's fix some food. The Maranth will likely be as punctual as usual. The two bridge burners made their way back up the trail. An hour after sunset, the flight of Black Maranth arrived, descending on their corals in a slithering flutter of wings to the circle of lanterns Picker and Blend had set out. One of them carried a passenger who clambered off as soon as his coral's six legs alighted on the stony ground. 
Pigger grinned at the cursing man. She said, over here, quick. Quick Ben's back. Yes. Great to see him again. Love seeing these guys, man. This is going to be a great book. We got some great characters. He spun to face her and asked, what in Hood's name have you been up to, Corporal? Her grin fell away as she said, not much, wizard. Why? Quick Ben glanced over his shoulder at the Black Maranth, then hastened to the position where Picker and Blend waited. He lowered his voice and said, we need to keep things simple, damn it. Coming over the hills, I almost fell out of that knobby saddle. There's Warren swirling around down here, power bleeding from everywhere. He stopped, stepped closer, eyes glittering. He said, from you too, Picker. Blend muttered, cursed after all. Picker glared at her companion and threw as much sarcasm into her tone as she could muster as she said, just like you suspected all along, right, Blend? You lying. <laughs> I tell you what, it sounds just like my kids fighting with each other. Oh, my word. <laughs> I'm sure that gets tiresome, but it's probably pretty funny at times. Yeah, they're generally not this hostile, but sometimes they do turn on each other when somebody is going to get in trouble. Oh, yeah. When they should be having a solid front, they start fighting amongst each other, you know? Oh, yes. <laughs> this is the trick that parents know. All you have to say something, they'll, they'll turn on each other. It's human nature. <laughs> <laughs> they always turn on each other. Quick Ben hissed. You've acquired the blessing of an ascendant. You idiot. Which one, Picker? She struggled to swallow with a suddenly dry throat. She said, uh, Treach? Quick Ben said, oh, that's just great. Picker scowled. What's wrong with Treach? <laughs> Perfect for a soldier. The Tiger of Summer. The Lord of Battle. Quick Ben interrupted. Five centuries ago, maybe. Treach veered into his soul taken form hundreds of years ago. The beast hasn't had a human thought since. It's not just mindless. It's insane, Picker. Blend snickered. Quick Ben whirled on her and asked, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Blend said, nothing, sorry. Picker rolled up her sleeve to reveal the torques. She said, it's these, Quick Ben. Can you get them off me? He recoiled upon seeing the ivory bands, then shook his head. He said, if it was a sane, reasonable ascendant, maybe some negotiation might be possible. In any case, never mind. Picker said, never mind, and reached out and gripped handfuls of rain cape. She shook the wizard and said, never mind, you sniveling worm. She stopped suddenly, eyes widening. Quick Ben regarded her with a raised eyebrow. He softly asked, what are you doing, Corporal? Picker <laughs> released him and said, uh, sorry, wizard. That was interesting. Do you think she's channeling something from Treach there? Like she lost herself for a minute? Maybe. That could very well be. We don't know her well enough either. She might be a hostile one. Yeah, I was just curious why she was angry and then suddenly stopped. Yeah, I think you're probably right. There may be something. I think it's more along the lines of that. Sighing, Quick Ben adjusted his cape. He said, Blend, lead the Maranth to the cache. Blend said, Sure, ambling toward the waiting warriors. Quick Ben asked, Who made the delivery, Corporal? Picker asked, The Torks? Quick Ben said, Forget the Torks. You're stuck with them. The council's from Darujistan. Who delivered them? Picker said, Odd thing that. A huge carriage showed up, as if from nowhere. One moment the trail's empty, the next there's six stamping horses in a carriage. Wizard, this trail up here can't manage a two wheeled cart, much less a carriage. The guards were armed to the teeth, too, and jumpy. I suppose that makes sense, since they were carrying 10,000 councils. Quick Ben muttered, Try Gal. Those people make me nervous. They make him nervous? Wow. That's saying a lot, given Quick Ben's power levels. Do you think it's due to their strength or their unpredictability? Kind of like a little too much like himself, maybe? I don't know. We don't know a ton about them and what they have no. to go through to do what they do yet so i don't want to say too much no but they during dead house they did a you know when we were introduced to these fellas you know they were they brought complete relief for the whole people as far as water so they were they were able to provide things and it was just everything they were able to do was just so amazing maybe it's because because that one uh they mentioned i forget they mentioned the one guy's name the carpal uh, and demisand carpal and how do i remember that name because <laughs> it, it, it's a great name so it's, a, it's another great strange name and he's powerful but i'm just kind of curious is he up there in the same level as quick ben and i don't think so i'm guessing so to be able to punch holes through reality maybe not quick ben level but just i mean enough of these fellows put together would give quick ben a you know a, a serious it could, it could hurt him. Let's put a pin in this. Let's come back to it next week because there's something that Mr. Erickson mentions about Quick Ben next week. I want to dive into this topic okay. a little bit more then. I don't want to spoil it before the episode next week. So we'll wait okay. till then to talk about it. Just remember we want to talk about it. Okay. Now, another question here. Did Picker lie about how many councils the Trigal delivered? Because it almost sounded to me like they burgled 300 councils from the stash 
to pay for these torques. I don't know. Was that part of the plan of, you know, getting those coins into that guy's purse? Not just the coins, but they were going to put the pebble to track the guy. Did, did that just make it easier to slow him down? I don't think so. She would have searched it regardless. Okay. That's true. So, okay, I, I don't know. Because she said, who's going to miss them? That's true. It's one of two options. They either confiscated them from somebody else sure. or they burgled them from this cash, which sure. is it, what I think it, happened. I think you're right. <laughs> they would do that. I could see them taking yes, it. Yes, yes. <laughs> when, when else are you going to be able to spend 300 councils? Man, get out of here. <laughs> get them. You know, <laughs> so you, know, you know you want those arm bracelets, Dave, those torques. Come on. Uh -huh. They're shiny. <laughs> They, they, were, they, they were wrapped in the molt hair of treats. And, and Quick Ben did say they were blessed. He did not say they were cursed. He said they are, in fact, blessed. The Ascendant may be insane, but it is blessed. <laughs> be careful who you tie yourself to. Yes, yes. After a moment, Quick Ben shook his head, then said, Now, my last question. The last tracker you sent off, where is it? Picker frowned. She said, Don't you know? They're your pebbles, wizard. Quick Ben asked, Who did you give it to? Picker said, a carver of trinkets. Quick Ben asked, the trinkets like the one you're wearing on your arm, Corporal? Picker said, well, yes, but that was his lone prize. I looked at all the rest and it was good, but nothing special. Quick Ben glanced over to where the black armored Maranth were loading wrapped columns of coin onto their quarrels under Blend's smirking gaze. That's nice of her to help. She's just sitting there smirking at him. She's probably smirking because they took that 300 bucks from him, or that 300 councils from him. It's like, oh. mm hmm. hmm. <laughs> Quick Ben said, well, I don't think it's gone far. I guess I'll just have to go and find it. Shouldn't take long. She watched him walk off a short distance, then sit cross-legged on the ground. The night air was growing cold, a west wind arriving from the Talon Mountains. The span of stars overhead had become sharp and crisp. Picker turned and watched the loading. Picker called out, Blend, make sure there's two spare saddles besides the wizards. Blend said, of course. The city of Pale wasn't much, but at least the nights were warm. Picker was getting too old to be camping out night after night, sleeping on cold, hard ground. The past week waiting for the delivery had settled a dull ache into her bones. At least with Darujistan's generous contribution, Dujek would be able to complete the army's resupply. Now, to our question about the weather in this area from mm. the episode where we talked about part one of chapter one, I guess if it's this cold at night, it could be decent during the day, like around yeah. 70 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So maybe it wouldn't be that bad in those carriages because we had no. thought Karuli might be really uncomfortable right no that sounds kind of nice that's not too bad it does yeah could you imagine that's kind of like denver is like that during the summertime you'll have this 70 80 degrees it was not you'll have like 90 and sometimes it'll get to 100 sometimes but it's real dry and at night it'll get like the low 60s yeah albuquerque is similar santa yeah. fe gorgeous great stuff with opon's luck they'd be on the march within a week picker thought off to another hood-kissed war, as if we ain't weary enough. Fainer's hoof. Who or what is the Panion Domin anyway? And we will finish out the chapter next week. Mm. For standout moments, Picker and Blend's banter back and forth. I enjoyed all of it in this episode. Oh, it's fantastic, man. They are hilarious. I look forward to it. I'm sure we're going to be treated to a bunch more of this as we continue. Blend goading Picker is yes. wonderful. It is. It's always wonderful. Being introduced to the crippled God and seeing how he rewards those that serve him. Yeah. It was really eye-opening. Yeah. This has always stuck with me. Very core memories. That tent, yes. like we talked about, the smoke from the seeds and then how yeah. he treats Munug yeah. left quite the impression on me. And I just got to say, I did. I mean, in, in, any encounter with the crippled God is going to always be core. Picker and Blend seemingly pilfering 300 councils from the Trigal delivery meant to supply Dujek's army. That was... That's pretty smooth. <laughs> pretty smooth. A little bit and, uh, and, suspicious. And, and smirk about it. Yeah, and I, and I think the sister and smirk about it while they were loading on that like one. Mm, a little bit light. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah. It's 10,000 councils. They aren't going to miss 300. Uh -huh. that's, what that's, what she's, okay. that's what she's thinking. You know, someone's always missing it. Yeah. Good thing this is not a, uh, like a uh, um, Guy Ritchie movie or so <laughs> somebody's going to come looking for that 300 councils. They will. <laughs> And then finally, Quick Ben admitting that the Trigal make him nervous says yeah. a lot about them. Very revealing. Very revealing. All right. Great job tonight, Billy. Hey, man. Great chapter. Great episode, man. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? I uh, just really love the. I always like when we start a book. And this is our number three, dude. And so I just love the continued intros to all the cast are going to be meeting so good. Yeah. I can't believe we're already on chapter two. It seems to be going pretty quick this time. Yeah. 
It's going really good. I'm enjoying it. You know, the thing I think also with this universe, the starts, even when we're professionals, knowing our way and our footing about, it's just different. Once you kind of hit book three, it's the pacing is different, man. You can feel it. You can just feel it from the start. Yeah. We'll see how it progresses through the book because I do remember there was quite a bit of build up, which yes. not so much action. And so we'll see how that feels. Yeah, there's a couple things that I remember in particular that I didn't dislike, but they're just kind of a little bit, there's different pacing, different stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.